Good morning, everyone. Uh, let's uh, start with Ravi's lecture today. All right, hi, everyone. Uh, so just a quick recap uh, of what we did last time with the spherical collapse, and then what we're going to do today is we'll put the physics of spherical collapse into to make an estimate of the abundance of virialized objects. Yeah? Um, and so, so the quick recap is, although it's a really simple model, just energy conservation, it works pretty well because more or less the rank order of binding energy of particles is preserved. Yeah? And the spherical collapse model is doing that. So that's, you know, even though collapse is lumpy and aspherical, uh, it, it's a reasonable approximation. Okay. Um, it's a reasonable approximation, but there's an interesting thing, which, which I haven't done, uh, because we've jumped immediately to the fully nonlinear model, spherical collapse, okay? Um, but I, I, I sort of noted in passing, right, that the, the spherical collapse, uh, we can write it, I guess we'll use this later, so I might as well write it on the board, um, one plus the nonlinear density is approximately one minus the linear theory density over the spherical collapse value and the critical linear theory value for collapse is about 1.686, okay? Um, and, uh, you know, and so, so I made the point, you know, this is sort of linear theory in the beginning, but if I expand this in a Taylor series, there will be terms of order delta squared, delta cubed. Those will be convolutions in k-space. Um, and so those are, um, uh, that's the mode coupling that's happening because of nonlinear evolution, okay? This is an approximation. We put up the exact parametric solution. If you expand that exact parametric solution in delta linear, delta linear squared, delta linear cubed, and so on, you'll get coefficients. Those coefficients are exact, so they're exact for the spherical collapse model, but if you were to solve the full, uh, the, the, the full um, equations of motion, including asphericity, then you might imagine you'd get very different stuff because of tidal effects, which are completely missing from the spherical collapse approach. But if you think of the full solution as having a monopole plus a quadrupole plus, so you, you decompose it into monopole, quadrupole, and so on, then the monopole terms to all orders are exactly the spherical collapse, okay? And so, so although you're making a, a big approximation here, it's in fact an exact approximation because you have solved the monopole exactly. Right? And so you're just missing quadrupole and higher order, higher order stuff. Okay. So, so it's worth remembering that, okay? that this is actually a, a, a much more powerful approximation than you might naively have thought, than you might naively have thought looking at the lumpy aspheric, aspherical collapse yeah, that we're modeling here. Okay. Um, the one last point I wanted to make before, before we, we, we do some statistics using this physics um, is the following. So we said that, uh, that this, this critical number for collapse, this thing is the same for all objects, okay? For all objects that collapse today, right? If I want objects that collapse at redshift one, then this number is higher by one plus, or the growth factor associated with redshift one, yeah. one plus z. Okay. Um, so this number is independent of mass, of the, of the final object. The nonlinear density is independent of mass of the final object. Um, and let's use that fact now, okay? So we can ask, um, if the final virial density um, is just some, uh, some so, so, the, so the final virial density is the mass over the volume, okay? But the mass was the initial volume because initially there was some patch. Initially, that patch had an overdensity, but at the initial time, the overdensity was 10 to the minus 5, right? It's that overdensity grown by linear theory that is order unity, but the actual initial density was uh, 10 to the minus 5. And so that means that the, 
the initial mass, which is 4 pi r i cubed over 3 times the background density times 1 plus the initial density inside r. This thing we can throw away. And so the initial mass is the initial volume, right? Co-moving uh, co density. And so the ratio of the initial and the final sizes is the nonlinear density. And this is the thing we said will be of order 200 times the background density okay, for, for all objects. So if they all have the same density, then we can ask, you know, what is the typical speed with which an object is moving inside the virialized object? And so the speed is, you know, the, the, the kinetic energy is the potential energy from the virial theorem, minus W is 2K. And so the scaling is like this. Um, and then, then this is just algebra that's plugging in for the mass. Um, you know, you say the, the, the mass is R virial cubed. Um, and, uh, and then you can just work through the algebra to see the scaling of V squared with mass or V squared with radius. So let's do V squared with mass. So the typical speeds are higher in the more massive halos. Massive clusters will be hotter. They will have the galaxies in them will be moving faster, and the gas in those clusters will be hotter. The X-ray gas that you observe, the kinetics, the, 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 the thermal sunyaev zeldovich effect will be, will, will be due to a hotter gas if the mass is higher, OK? From this, you can also work out the scalings with redshift, with time, because it's 200 times the background density, and so that's why I've written it in terms of h. h is a function of redshift, and so now you can work out what should be, uh, for a fixed mass, objects at high redshift should be hotter, because h was higher in the past. Okay, And so this is quite a powerful thing, knowing that the, that the density is always the same, whatever the mass. And the density, that density is some multiple of the background density. So high redshift objects are denser, they're hotter, uh, everything is moving faster. Okay? So this will help us when we want to model redshift space distortions. Yeah? This fact that, that we can model this. But in addition to the redshift space distortions, it helps us model X-ray clusters and so on. Yeah? We're going there. So, so, right. So, 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 so we'll make an estimate of that. that, that that's what we're going to do today. Um, as with everything, this is going to be a model. OK? And so in the model, we're always going to have stuff that is virilizing now. So an object like you're describing that virilized at redshift 2 and then not much happened to it, that object is something that uh, we will say accreted a tiny amount of mass from then to now. So the mass changed by a little bit, and now it has a new virilized mass. Okay? So it's slightly artificial, but, but we, we'll come back to that. Um, OK, so, so, so we're set. right? Most of the nonlinear physics will come from the virial theorem and from the fact that all objects have the same density, whatever their mass. When we start to write the halo model, we will make a lot of use of this. OK. Um, just for completeness, I won't go through it here, but I've given you the hydrostatic equilibrium equations that you would use to convert to gas temperatures from, from the masses that we have. Yeah. OK. OK. So. We, we've argued that all objects should have the same density, whatever their mass, but we have not yet made an estimate of how many massive objects there should be and how many low mass objects there should be. So that's the next thing we're after. Okay? And uh, so, so the way to make this estimate is called the excursion set approach. Um, I, will, I will give you the, the simplest version of the approach. And then I will just say a few words about the uh, more recent developments in it. But I think the simplest version is a good way to think in general about no the nonlinear object formation. OK? So let's, uh, let's get started. So, so first, there's a series of pictures 
In core moving coordinates, so the expansion has been divided out of the box. This is a box at redshift 20, and then we click forward in time. And so you can see the structure early to late. And the thing you want to notice is that nothing moved across the box. This is cold dark matter, right? So the speeds are all small. Um, and uh, so structure formation is local, right? The, the mass that made this guy didn't come from very far away. Uh, it didn't come from across the box. This void, it simply expanded, okay? Um, all right, so, uh, so, so structure formation is local, okay? So we want to try to use this fact in estimating uh, in estimating what objects are, okay? Now, what's an object? Well, so if we look at this, then we'll say, oh, that looks like a place where collapse happened. That look, looks like a place where collapse happened. And in fact, all of the little yellow dots, this thing has been color-coded by density. And so the yellow are the high-density regions. And so, you know, each little knot here corresponds to a, a little virilized halo, okay? And so we want to make an estimate of how many big guys and how many little guys. So what does the guy in the simulation do? The guy in the simulation will come here and will, will try to you know, count up all the particles that are in that thing. But how do, how do yeah. This one is just dark matter. The baryons, for the most part, fall where the dark matter is. Um, for, for this, we're going to ignore the difference between baryons and dark matter, basically because the baryons, uh, there might be small scale differences, right? There might be the feedback that's heating the gas and making the gas distribution a little different from the dark matter. But on scales of a megaparsec or so, there's no difference. Okay, um, okay. So, uh, so, 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 so this is a dark matter only simulation, just, just uh, for, for simplicity here. And uh, now we're going to ask, what, what do you do? How do you find a halo in a simulation? And so one way you might do it is you might say, oh, you know, um, let me choose a, a random position. And you know, I could have chosen many random positions, but here, just for, you know, to illustrate, I've chosen centered on this guy, okay? And then you say, is this, is the mass inside this volume 200 times the background density? And if it's not, then you say, let me go to a smaller scale, and a smaller scale, and a smaller scale, and you keep asking, is it 200 times the background density? When it is, then you say, I found an object that's a virilized halo. Then you can do the check. No, you have the particles. You can go and measure the speeds and measure the potential energy and make sure it's virilized, make sure it's bound, okay? And so, so that, 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 will, that, will, that will work, right? So, so it's pretty efficient. But our goal is, is to model what is happening in the simulations, not by doing this, but by predicting it from the initial conditions, okay? And so, so we want to make a prediction of this thing from the initial conditions, and so now we can ask, you know, just like there's the critical density 200 times the background density in the nonlinear field, in the linear field, it's this number. So let's go to that nonlinear field and play the same game. We start with a big smoothing scale, and we shrink, and we shrink, and we shrink, and we ask, when is it 1.686? Yeah. And when it is, then we say, this is probably the patch that will go on to make a halo. Yeah. And, and you've seen already, the patches don't move too much, right? They're just going to shrink. Uh, yeah. Okay, so, uh, so, so this will be 1.686 divided by, 10 to, uh, by the growth factor from redshift zero, so it's, yeah? Okay. Um, okay, so, so then you find the place that is the right density. Okay, and then, so, so, so now the question is, how often does that happen? So let's, let's go back here, right? So um, this, hap this will happen in this point in space, this point in space. So, you know, I want to know what fraction of positions in the Gaussian random field have the critical density on this smoothing scale, have the critical density on this smoothing scale, 
or have the critical density on a tiny smoothing scale. And that will tell me something about the fraction of the mass in the universe that is bound up in small objects or the fraction of the mass in the universe that is bound up in big objects, in massive objects. Yeah? So that's the goal. That's what we're going to try to do. So, so, so how, can we, how can we picture this? So we're going to be looking as a function of smoothing scale, right? We, we take a big smoothing scale and we ask, on what scale is it the critical density? Notice that I started on a big scale and I came down to a smaller scale and I didn't start from a small scale and grow. Okay? Why is that? So the reason for that is if I start on a small scale, then maybe it would already have been overdense. But if, suppose its density was 5 instead of 1.686, okay? Then we would have said, oh, sure, it should have collapsed. But it means that somewhere around it is 3, and somewhere around it is 1.686. And the 1.686 is the thing that will have collapsed today. And if it collapsed today, everything inside it is still inside it. And so that's the mass today. Not the small mass in the middle, but the big mass. And so the reason for starting big and come small is to get the largest possible mass associated with this patch in space that will have collapsed to make a halo today. Okay? So, so, so that's the logic. And so, so on, on this axis here, we're going to make a plot. The y-axis is going to be what's the density. And the x-axis is the smoothing scale. And the smoothing scale, big scales will be here, and small scales will be here. Okay? And then we'll ask, you know, when I smooth the density field with a big filter, the big circles that I drew before, what's the density? So if the filter is big enough, a thousand megaparsecs, then the density should be close to zero because the universe is homogeneous. Okay? And then as I shrink smoothing scales, the density should pop up and down. Okay? And so it should pop up and down as I decrease the smoothing scale, as I decrease the smoothing scale, until finally I find the scale where it crosses 1.686. On the scale where it crosses 1.686, I say, oh, what was the smoothing scale? That smoothing scale corresponds to a mass. And this is my prediction for the mass of the collapsed object. OK? Um, and so, so if this walk crosses this barrier after a few steps, that's a large smoothing scale. That's a massive halo. If it crosses it after very many steps, that's a small smoothing scale. That's a low mass halo. OK? Um, and of course, you know, I, I, this, this, I could keep doing the smoothing, I could keep plotting what is the density as a function of smoothing scale, but there's no point continuing for this position in space because, you know, I found the biggest one, it already crossed, so all the mass that would be associated with the smaller smoothing scale is contained inside this one, right? So, so this is the right mass, okay? Um, now, one reason for, for continuing to draw this walk is the following. Suppose I was interested in objects at high redshift and compared to objects at low redshift. Okay, so let me, let me put that again. I drew a barrier here. This barrier was 1.686, okay? Now let's imagine that I wanted to, I wanted to describe objects um, at some other time. At some other time, this number will be a different number, different by the growth factor, okay? And now I have a choice. Do I want to make this diagram, this random walk? Do I want to make this random walk in the initial field where the fluctuations are 10 to the minus five? Or can I take the initial field, multiply everything by the growth factor to redshift zero? So now I have one field, and now I will describe evolution 
just by saying I want a barrier of a different height for the different redshifts for the same linear field. Yeah? So that's what we're going to do. The barrier will be a higher barrier for high redshift, will be a lower barrier for low redshift. And so that's why I was drawing that barrier scrolling down from high redshift to low redshift. Okay? And so that means that from where the barrier intersects this walk, or where this walk intersects the barrier, as I decrease the height of the barrier, so you know this walk will have continued over here, so, the, so it will have crossed the high redshift barrier somewhere here, then a lower redshift barrier, it crosses here, then as the barrier drops, it crosses here, 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 here. Then when the barrier is here, then that means that the mass jumped from this value to this value. Does that make sense? Because we're always asking, when did it first cross the barrier? So as we lower it, we can just trace out where this walk first crosses the barrier as the barrier is changing height. And this is going to tell me the mass of the halo at high redshift, at lower redshift, at lower redshift, the mass is increasing smoothly, is smoothly, smoothly, and then the mass jumps, so there was a merger. Yeah? This is the, uh, okay, so this will be, suppose, the, suppose redshift zero is this one. So at redshift zero, the object had this mass. At redshift one, the object, the barrier height was here, and if the barrier height was here, the object had this mass, and this is a smaller smoothing scale, so a smaller mass. At redshift two, let's say the barrier height was here, so the object had even smaller mass, and so on. So this random walk is giving me the mass as a function of time of this object. It's giving the entire merger history of this object. Yeah? And so this is kind of powerful, right? Because astronomers like to talk about how things merge, whether the, whether the change in mass was smooth accretion or the change in mass was because of big mergers. If the jump is big, that's a, you know, my, my object hit something the same mass as it, it doubled its mass, or it was a small, it was, you know, a small thing that merged onto a big thing, so the mass jumped a lot. Or it was doing as he described, right, that uh, it basically it formed at high redshift and then mass trickled onto it, and so it kind of accreted smoothly, okay? And so, so this is a picture that lets you describe those things, but it lets you do that in a statistical sense, right? Because now we can ask, oh, how, how likely was it that I have a walk like this? So in a Gaussian random field, if I went to some other position in space and I made the random walk, then maybe the walk will not do this, but maybe that walk will do something like this, no? For some other place in space. And so if I make a quick sketch, then you know, one point in space, the walk can do something like this. Um, another point in space, the walk can do something like that. Um, and, uh, you know, still somewhere else, maybe it does like this, right? So, the statistics, Gaussian statistics means that if I take a fixed smoothing scale, then of the, so this, so this is density, this was smoothing scale. As a function, you know, I can ask, what's the distribution of heights that these walks reach if I don't worry about the barrier? What is the distribution? And Gaussian statistics means it will be a Gaussian distribution. Most will hit here, some will hit here. But when I allow many more steps, if I was choosing this smoothing scale, now here I will get a much broader Gaussian distribution. Here was a kind of narrow Gaussian distribution. Okay? And so, so that means that I can think of this, maybe I should keep this, uh, um, so, so, so this is explicitly the Gaussian thing. At very small scales, it's very narrow Gaussian. Uh, at very large scales, it's very narrow Gaussian. At very small scales, a very broad Gaussian. Okay. Um, 
So all we want now is the statistics, you know, given that the distribution on any scale is Gaussian, I want to know what is the probability that I cross the barrier of this height. Okay, so if I keep the barrier to have one height, then the white walk, it crossed here. So this tells me one halo of this mass. Actually, a particle in a halo of this mass. The blue one is a particle in a halo of slightly bigger mass at redshift zero. And uh, the white one is a particle of, in a halo of this mass at redshift zero. But if I want to ask, I took this halo at redshift zero, then in the future, what will its mass be? The barrier will be smaller, so I will follow the mass where it crosses the barrier. In the past, what was its mass? It was here. And then this walk will continue, and then somewhere here it will cross. Yeah? So for one object, I look at one walk. For the statistics at one time of many objects, then I, then I keep one barrier, and I look for the statistics of many walks. The, so, yeah, so this is, so, so I should think of each walk as a random position in space around which I made the walk and I asked what was the density as a function of smoothing scale. Does that make sense? Yeah? Okay. And so, and so, so that's why if I choose random positions in space, then in a Gaussian random field, I will get Gaussian statistics on any smoothing scale. Yeah, so that was the beautiful thing about Gaussian statistics, right? The PDF is the same on all smoothing scales. Okay. Um, and so, so now we're going to do that problem. So, um, so we're not going to do the evolution of mass problem. We're going to do at a fixed time, what is the distribution of masses? Yeah, so I was just motivating what you can do with this. And then we can come back and ask, what is the evolution problem? How do we do the, the evolution problem? So now for a fixed time, we want to know what is the distribution of masses. Um, I will come back. Uh, yeah, maybe, maybe I should say this one. Okay. So, so, so we, we will, you know, our goal will be to ask what is the fraction of walks that cross the barrier of a fixed height. Okay. And so you can already see this is going to be something that's a kind of general problem that, that may already have been solved in other fields, right? Because this is Brownian motion hitting a barrier. Okay, so it's a, it's a pretty rich problem. Um, but let, let's put this completely in the language that is, uh, uh, that, that is useful for us. And so, so that, for that, we have to do one small, one small thing. So far, I described the walk, and I said this is a smoothing scale, big smoothing scale, small smoothing scale. And we said we can convert from smoothing scale to mass, because you know, all the, the radius is giving me the mass. Now, because we've established that the distribution on any smoothing scale should be a Gaussian, broad Gaussian, narrow Gaussian, the width of the Gaussian will be sigma squared with the smoothing filter. Yeah, so this was the expression we had for the variance before. So this is telling us the width of the Gaussian as I change the smoothing scale. And this R cubed is M, okay? Um, so, because this, this is a monotonic relation between smoothing scale and variance, instead of plotting smoothing scale here, I will plot the variance. Okay? And so, so I use S to mean smoothing scale but it's the variance, okay? And so, the, and so the variance is small on large scales and the variance is big on 
variance is small on large scales and big on small scales. Okay, why is that useful? So the reason that is useful is that we know that this will be a Gaussian on each smoothing scale. And in principle, the width of, you know, how the width of the Gaussian depends on smoothing scale depends on the power spectrum. But now, by plotting things in this variable rather than this variable, we have removed the dependence on the power spectrum. So it means we can study the problem for all power spectra with one plot. And so we will solve, when we solve the first crossing distribution, we will solve the first crossing distribution in the, in the variables delta and sigma squared. And then we will convert from sigma squared to mass. And that conversion will depend on power spectrum. Okay, so we'll convert from sigma squared to mass by doing this thing. Okay, so, so this is a powerful approach because it means that you can, you can solve the problem for arbitrary power spectra. So for arbitrary cosmological models, not quite, because if I change the cosmological model, I will change the growth factor. So I change not just the power spectrum, but the growth with redshift. That's this axis. And so changing the growth factor just says I change the mapping between the height and redshift. But that there is a barrier, I don't change. And so that means this picture, this solution, will be valid for arbitrary cosmology, arbitrary growth factor, arbitrary power spectrum. So it's a big simplification. Yeah? Then we will convert from sigma squared to mass and from barrier height to a redshift using the cosmology dependent growth factor. Okay? So maybe what I should put here is uh, this thing we'll have something like with a, with a growth factor. No? And, and, and the growth factor depends on cosmology. Okay. We're good? Yes. Yes. Yeah. Um, okay. So, 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 so let's sketch the solution. Okay. So the so solution goes like this. Um, so we have a, uh, so the critical density, there's the barrier, and we want to know how many walks have crossed the barrier, okay, for the first time on scale S. Now, it's a complicated problem, right, because it's pretty jagged, the walks. So it's useful to first study a simple case in which the walks are completely smooth, okay? So here the walks are completely smooth. The way I've drawn them, I've drawn them so that, you know, I will, there, there will be a, another set of walks going like this, and I've drawn it so that the, you should imagine the distribution of walks is the same distribution, right? So it's a Gaussian distribution of heights, just, where, just that the, the walks are totally smooth, right? So like this. And so there will be many walks like this, fewer like this, and very few like this. Okay, um, all right. Now for every walk that is above the barrier on this smoothing scale, we know it must have crossed at some earlier smoothing scale because all these walks crossed at some earlier time. So this integral, which is just the integral over a Gaussian, it's the tail of the Gaussian, is the same as the integral of all the walks that crossed at some scale less than this s. So that's what I've written here. We want the integral of all the walks that first cross on scale s times the probability that they're above the threshold on this smoothing scale, given that they first crossed on this smoothing scale. 
But we know that this thing should equal the tail of the Gaussian. Everyone OK? Sorry? Yeah. So, um, so all the walks that crossed here, think of this as the left-hand side. So, and, and we know the left-hand side. It's the tail of a Gaussian. It's like an error function. This one equals all the walks that crossed here and are still above, or crossed here and still above, and crossed here and are still above. So the, this is the fraction that crossed at some s. And this is the fraction that are still above, given that they crossed for the first time at s. Okay. And this is a kind of clumsy thing to write, because it's obvious from this picture that if they crossed here, they are still above. So, so this probability is 1. No, so I did, a, I did more work than I should do, but because I want to set up the problem for when the walks are jagged. We will use the same logic. Okay? So when this, when this is 1, this is going to be a simple thing to solve, because then I will have, if this is 1, then this is ds, fs, integral from 0 to s. I just take the derivative with respect to s. That will give me the thing I want. And I can take this derivative with respect to s. It's the derivative of an error function. So I can do that. And I will have an estimate of the mass function. OK? So that's one simple case. Another simple case is when the walks are not completely smooth, but they are completely jagged. Completely, uh, no, not jagged, but they are completely random steps. And so that means they are more like I drew here. They went up and down like this rather than completely smooth. What would that correspond to? So you remember in a Gaussian field, the K modes are all independent of each other. So now suppose that my smoothing filter, when I, when I do this and I ask what's the, what's the density, what's the density, what's the density, I didn't specify how I'm smoothing the field, but I think we all had the idea that it's, it's what I see, no? That I, I count everything inside this sphere, inside this sphere, inside this sphere. But there's no particular reason why I couldn't decide to smooth with a Gaussian instead of with a top hat, or smooth with some other shape. I can use any filter I want to do this. We use the top hat because when we did the spherical collapse model, we, it was a top hat object that was collapsing. But just to play the game, to see how this will depend on what filter I choose, suppose the filter was one that is letting in one K mode at a time. One K mode at a time. If it's one K mode at a time, so it's sharp in K space, not in real space, then because the K modes are all independent, each of these steps will be completely independent. Because as I change the smoothing scale, I let in one more k-mode, one more k-mode, one more k-mode. And so the walk is going up or down depending on whether I added a plus or a minus k-mode. Yeah? So those walks will be completely uncorrelated steps. So they will be completely jagged. That means but if I had a completely jagged walk that arrived here, and now I want to calculate this piece, what is the probability that the, the, the walk arrived here and is still above the barrier? Then, well, it's going to take completely random steps up and down, up and down, until it gets to this smoothing scale. And so as it takes those completely random steps, it means, because they're completely random, half of them they will end up above, and half of them, they will end up below. And so for this problem also, it's very simple. This probability is half. OK? And so reality is something in between, right? It's not the completely smooth, and it's not the completely jagged. But it will be something in between. And that, this thing will be complicated for the something in between. But the two extremes are easy. Oops. OK, so the two extremes are completely smooth walks where the probability was 1, and completely, um, uh, completely uncorrelated steps where this probability was half. And so then if you do that, 
then you know, taking the derivative of the error function is giving this term. And then there will be, uh, these two solutions will just differ by a factor of two. Some of you will know the literature and will have heard of the press sector approach. The factor of two in the press sector approach is this factor. Yeah, essentially, press sector solved the problem where it's completely smooth walks, um, and then Bond et al. in 91 solved the problem where it's completely jagged walks. Yeah. But the, the, the one we're most interested in is where the walks are somewhere in between. So what to do? So for something in between, we can try to write out, no? We can try to write what is the probability that the walk has height delta one on scale one, delta two on scale two, delta n on scale n, and then on scale n plus one, it has height delta c, or it's bigger than delta c, and so on, okay? But you can see this is going to be a painful, I mean, we can write the joint multivariate Gaussian, but it's a, it's a painful calculation. Yeah? So if we wanted to solve this problem, we would have to integrate over all possibilities of this multivariate thing and impose the condition that on the nth, that on all the first n steps, it was below the barrier and then it was above. And so you can try to write it, but it's uh, not efficient. It's more efficient to instead say, um, instead of thinking of the walk as many, many steps, the height after many, many steps, think of it as the height on one scale and then the derivatives, because I can describe a curve by a value and the derivatives rather than the full set of heights, right? It's just any function I can, I can think that way. And the virtue of doing that is that because the walks have correlations between the steps, if you impose that it has a certain height on a certain scale, you have already made a constraint on the walk's height on many other scales. And so that's why you are efficiently taking care of a bunch of these correlations by instead of working in this basis, in working in the basis of delta and derivatives on some scale. Um, and so, so, if you do that, then what you want is you want to say the fraction of walks that first cross on scale S are the, I, I want the joint probability that the walk has height delta on scale S and the derivative is delta prime, okay? And I want all the walks where the height is um, between delta c and, uh, and, and something to do with the slope, so let me, let me write this a little more clearly. What I really want is that delta on scale s should be bigger than delta c, and I want delta on s minus delta s, so the previous step, I want it to be less than delta C, okay? I also want all the other ones to be less than delta C, and I'm not going to impose that constraint now. I'm just going to see how well can I do if I just add this one, right? Because my goal was to reduce this big problem with big multivariate Gaussian to fewer dimensions. I'm trying to do it by saying, let me put a constraint on, this, uh, on one other scale. Um, and, and we'll see where we go, okay? So this one, I can write as delta S minus um, delta S d delta by ds, no? So, 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 so this one really means this one. And, uh, and so that means that I want delta S plus delta S delta prime. And so that means I want delta S to be bigger than delta C, but I want delta S to be less than delta C plus something to do with the slope. So that's the condition that's written up there. Yeah? So I want this, and I want that the walk 
crossed the barrier going upwards, which means I want the derivative to be positive. Okay? And so, so, so we just work with the two variables, and now we have to do you know, the integral of these two variables with these constraints. No, this one should be positive, and this one should be between delta C, and then it's just math, okay? So then you can, you can write this out. It's 2D Gaussian, not a huge infinite dimensional Gaussian. Um, and uh, and so, 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 so it's, a, it's a simple approximation. We can ask how well it works. Um, the other nice thing is the logic is pretty general. And so it doesn't, I mean, here we've done it for Gaussian statistics, but this could be a non-Gaussian PDF, so you can apply this to non-Gaussian fields. Um, and uh, also, we've done it for a barrier of constant height, but the barrier could have some shape, and then you can, tr you can work this out for the, if the barrier depends on S. And I mentioned that because yesterday someone asked about ellipsoidal collapse, about triaxial collapse, and uh, a crude approximation to triaxial collapse is that the, the, the critical density to form an object is higher for the low mass halos, which means a crude approximation for ellipsoidal collapse is to say this barrier associated with making a halo at a fixed time has a shape that's more like this. Okay? Um, and uh, so you can use the same logic to solve, the, solve that problem. Okay. Um, so, so, so that's the solution. Um, and uh, this solution has the piece that we had before that was the derivative of the error function plus correction. Um, and this is the correction that's saying, uh, now I want to impose that the walks are crossing upwards. And you can imagine there would be more corrections if I were correcting for many more previous crossings. But this is the first correction. Um, and it's a correction that will, so, so, so let's, let's think a little bit about this correction. So the correction matters only when, uh, when this parameter starts getting big. So maybe I should talk a little bit about what new is, so new is this combination of the critical density over the variance. Yeah? And so, so the reason for doing that so the reason for doing that, let me put up the solution while we while we discuss this. Um, so the reason for doing this is that's a solution of the random walk problem in these variables. Now if I specify my cosmology, I have specified the growth factor, so I can convert this into something as a function of redshift. And if I specify the power spectrum, I now have specified the conversion from this variable to mass. And so now I have a prediction that lets me translate from this to halo abundances, okay? That one will look like this, F nu d nu was the fraction of random walks that crossed on smoothing scale s. So this is the, so each random walk is like a position in space. So this is the, or it's a, or it's like a, each random, each random walk is associated with a position in space, so if I can think of it as each random walk is associated with a particle in the initial conditions. And so each, so, so, so this is like the fraction of mass that is in halos of mass m at redshift, at this redshift, for a power spectrum that converts this to this. And so this one, this is a fraction of mass, so there's a number density of objects. This number density of objects, each halo of this mass has, contributes, so this is the number, this is the mass that such an object contributes. If I take this, This is the fraction of mass that is in halos of this mass. This is the fraction of the total mass. 
So there's an implicit assumption that this integral is the background density, because the assumption is all halos, or all mass is in halos of some mass. That's why you get the background density. Yeah, so, so this is the ansatz for converting the first crossing distribution into an approximation for the halo mass function. Okay? Um, all right. Now, <laughs> we can think a little bit, you know, uh, is it true that all the walks are going to cross? Because if they don't, then not all objects are in halos, and I won't, I won't get this integral. So in cold dark matter models, the, the walks are jagged, they're very jagged. This variance diverges at very small scales in CDN, so all the walks cross the barrier. And so that assumption is good. If you're interested in warm dark matter models, then not all the walks are going to cross, then talk to me, okay? So I, I won't go into that here. Um, okay, um, so, so, so this, is, this is one approximation, okay? Um, oh, so, so this was the bit about warm dark matter models. Um, we've sort of gone through the simplifications about why this was useful, uh, that you can, you can translate arbitrary cosmologies and arbitrary power spectra, okay? Um, so, so that's all this is saying. Um, okay, let, let me, we'll, we'll, we'll come back to this. Um, so, so, now, so now let's go one, uh, one step further, okay? So, so now we'll do the mergers of objects, right? So we'll try to do different times, okay? Um, so, so this is a picture of the particles that were in a halo at redshift zero in a simulation, and we ask where were those particles at some earlier time? I think at redshift two, okay? And so you can see that the particles that make up the halo were in a bigger patch, and in that bigger patch, you can identify all the objects that are 200 times the background density at that time, so that's the little circles there. They look like they overlap because it's a 3D sphere and uh, it's just been projected. They don't really overlap, okay? Um, and so, you know, the, the, the big object at redshift zero was in many pieces at redshift two. Um, if you were interested in the gravity wave problem, the gravity waves, we care about the mergers of binary black holes. We would like to make an estimate of what's the expected stochastic background. This is how you do it. Right? We, we, we will be going through this calculation now, right? You, because it's the mergers of these guys that are making the gravity wave signal. The, the massive galaxy halos that are merging at redshift two, redshift one, and then the waves propagate to us, right? Um, so, okay. Um, so what's the toy model? So the toy model is you have a bunch of smaller spheres that are shrinking, right? Um, to, to make your final guy, right? Um, and, uh, so, so, so what does that correspond to? So, so here's the picture, right? You have lots of smaller things that are going to fall together. But now the, the toy model is that this was at redshift 1000. It was a patch that we identified that had density 1.686 divided by growth factor, okay? So it, it, that's the patch. Inside this patch, there is substructure. And so this is drawing the substructure of that patch. And the substructure here we've drawn to, let's say, uh, all, this, all the smaller pieces that are double the density. Okay? And that would correspond to asking the question, oh, these guys, they should all have collapsed at some higher redshift. As they are collapsing, they will be moving together because the big guy is also collapsing because by redshift zero, it should collapse. And so what is happening is I have this collapse happening and they're all moving together to collapse. Sort of like you saw in the movie, right? And the result of that is that associated with this patch is a merger history. Initially, you had lots of small pieces, two, two, and four. And then as this shrinks, then these things will start to merge with each other. And so the things that are close to each other will merge with each other first. So you know, these guys will collapse, then they will merge with each other, then they will merge together with each other before they merge with this. And then this side will merge with this side. 
Yeah? So, so you can see associated with the initial substructure is the merger history tree of the patch. And this works because it's CDM, because nothing is moving far. And so if they're close initially, they will merge with each other initially. It's not that this guy will somehow merge with that guy before it merges with this guy. Yeah? So that's why we can use the initial Gaussian statistics to calculate everything later. Okay? So, so this is another picture of what this calculation is going to do. Okay? Of the merger history. This is, again, the merger history. But we're going to get a lot of information yeah, from, from, from the, the initial Gaussian statistics. Okay? Um, Oh, oh so, so this was showing you, you know, another picture of the, the pieces that merge with each other. And I, we had used this before, right, to say this merges to merge to merge to make the final guy. Yeah. Okay. Um, so, so if we wanted to do this problem, then we would say associated with a higher redshift is a higher barrier. Okay, and so now I want to know, given that I had a walk that crossed, given that I had a walk that crossed the scale, so it has some mass at redshift zero, what is the mass at redshift two? Yeah, and so I, now I want, instead of solving the problem of walks crossing a barrier of height delta C. I now want to solve the problem of given that they had a big mass at redshift zero, what was the smaller mass at redshift Z? And it's just a same random walk problem, just a one extra conditional distribution for the, for the Gaussian. And so it, it has the same kind of solution, just with a different, different Gaussian that you write. Yeah. So, so you can write that problem, right? The solution is the same one as before, the term with an error, you know, the thing that's the derivative of an error function plus a correction, and that's it. Um, OK? Uh, so, so we can, and so now you can do this for, you know, one redshift, another redshift, and so on. And so you can describe now how likely it is that an object of 10 to the 15 solar masses had a piece that was 10 to the 14 solar masses at redshift one. So you can ask, in particular, what fraction of its mass was in pieces of 10 to the 10 at redshift one or at redshift 10. Yeah? How does the mass, you know, how is the mass partitioned into smaller pieces at each redshift? So how likely is it that the 10 to the 15 solar mass guy was 9.9 .9 times 10 to the 15 solar masses at redshift two? Very unlikely. How likely was it that an object of mass 10 to the 11 today was 9.9 .9 times 10 to the 10 at redshift 2, very likely. Okay, so you can quantify that kind of thing. Um, so th these are very useful things to be able to just get a handle on what structure was like at, at earlier times. Yeah. Uh, okay. So there's one, one, one final thing I want to show you that you can do with this construction. Okay. Um, and so, so, so the thing I want to now model is is the fact that when the Gaussian field starts out as Gaussian, it evolves, right? And we said it's going to become some non-Gaussian field. Can we understand the shape of that non-Gaussian distribution? Okay? So I want to try to model that now. So the idea is to go back to the spherical evolution mapping, uh, the, the, the one I wrote on the board here, this one. And to say, 
nonlinear density is related to the linear density. Okay, so let's rearrange this to write the linear density in terms of the nonlinear density. That's just a rearranging. And now we'll say, look, um, this, it, w it was kind of my y-axis, right? Because that's the linear density divided by the spherical collapse value, but that's it, right? It's a, this is the y-axis. M is a monotonic function between the mass to the radius and the radius to the smoothing scale. So this is really like S. And so that means if I fix the volume today, then I will get a curve which is this as a function of s. Okay? So for a fixed volume, there will be a curve which is this as a function of this. So let's look at what that looks like. Okay, so there's the random walk. Oh, there's the random walk space, right? The smoothing scale density. Um, and those curves look like if I pick a, a volume, then I will get a curve that looks like this, okay? You can kind of read off why it should look like that. So, when, uh, let me write mass over volume over here. So, when this value is zero, then this is one. That means this is zero, and that means the mass is the volume, is the co-moving density times volume. And so when it crosses zero, that is where m equals v. So if I, if I fixed my smoothing scale to be 10 megaparsecs, then this contains a mass, which is background density times 10 megaparsec volume, okay? So suppose this was the 10 megaparsec smoothing scale. So on smaller smoothing scales, this will have a smaller value. And on bigger smoothing scales, this will have a bigger value okay, from that curve. Uh, and so, so, so how can we see that? As I increase the mass, so increasing the mass means I go this way, smaller smoothing scale, uh, bigger smoothing scales, smaller variance. As I increase the mass, that's like a bigger nonlinear density. The bigger nonlinear density means a bigger linear density. But the bigger linear density can't get bigger than delta C. For then the nonlinear density, one minus one with a negative would be diverging. And so when this is infinite, this is delta C. Infinite mass means humongous smoothing scale. And so on very large smoothing scales, this is going to delta C. So this is a 10 megaparsec late time volume. I will have a curve which looks like it goes from delta C down to this scale and keeps going down. Okay. Um, all right. If I changed my volume and I was making this curve not for 10 megaparsecs but for 100, then 100 means the mass when the overdensity is zero is a bigger mass, so bigger smoothing scale. So that's the one for a bigger volume. It has to still go up to delta C and then it keeps going down, okay? So these are moving barriers that have a different shape depending on this, this value. And now the problem of a random walk that crosses this barrier is telling me the fraction of mass that is in cells of size 10 megaparsecs today, or the fraction of mass that is in cells of 100 megaparsecs today. And from this you can see that the random walk problem we solved before of a constant barrier, that is just the limit in which this volume is zero. Because when this volume is zero, then this density is diverging, and if this density is diverging, that's saying that this is delta C. And that's why that's the horizontal value for all smoothing scales. Yeah? 
And so that means that now, in this picture, this random walk, which before we thought of as evolution, by making the, the, the horizontal barrier drop with time, so we could read off mass as a function of redshift. We can also think of it as, oh, this is my halo that at redshift zero has this mass, but surrounding it, on the 10 megaparsec scale, the mass is this, and surrounding it on the 100 megaparsec scale, the mass is this. So I have the density profile around it today. OK? The density profile around it at redshift 1,000 was something we can calculate from Gaussian statistics. The redshift profile, uh, the, the density profile around it at redshift zero in the nonlinear field, I can calculate from the first crossing, given that it crossed the pink here, then when did it cross the green, when did it cross the, the white, and so on. Okay? It's the same calculation, right, as the evolution with time is the density profile with environment. So that's a key insight. The idea that time evolution is the same as a density profile. OK? Because if, if the profile is falling steeply, then the way the mass will arrive, so if it's falling steeply, there's not much to come. If the mass profile is very shallow, that means in the future, stuff is there to, to be accreted. Right? And so you can. You, you can just work out what the accretion history will be from the density profile. Um, OK. If I was drawing this, this set of curves, but I didn't want the distribution of the density profiles, or what is the, uh, so, OK, so I've described the, the, the density profiles, but I could simply ask, you know, what's the first crossing distribution of the green? And that's the PDF of the mass in cells of size 10 megaparsecs, or the PDF of the mass in cells of size 100 megaparsecs. You can see that as I start going to 100 megaparsecs, 200 megaparsecs is becoming steeper. But if it's very steep, that's Gaussian. And so the fact that it's getting tilted that's what makes the non-Gaussian PDF, OK? Because the first crossing distribution of this will be slightly different from the first crossing distribution of a vertical line here. On large smoothing scales, most walks are between here and here, right? Because on small smoothing scales, this distribution is narrow. And so it doesn't matter if my barrier looks like this or my barrier looks like this. They're all crossing here anyway. So the PDF will be close to Gaussian. But as I go to small smoothing scales, then the difference between vertical and curved is big. The distribution will be very non-Gaussian, will be very different from the Gaussian. Okay, so, so, so this lets you calculate those things, lets you calculate the profiles, and there's a very close connection between environment and evolution. And if, if there's one message from this, that's the, one, that's the thing you really want to remember. Yeah, there's a very close connection between environment and evolution. OK. Um, OK, so this, this was the, the model for the PDF, um, for, for the evolution from the Gaussian to the non-Gaussian thing. Um, and, uh, OK, so, so let's talk a little bit more about the correlation between environment um, and, uh, and halo masses. Because I, the, the direction I want to go is I want to start trying to set up the clustering of halos, so that not just the mass function, but the spatial distribution of the halos. And you can see that we should have some, uh, some way of estimating that from the picture that I had before of the big round thing with small pieces in it. Because when I described that thing, I had the big round thing with pieces in it. And we asked, you know, at rate of zero, they're all together. But I could have drawn the same picture 
And I could have said, at redshift zero, they're not all together. At you know, one Hubble time from now, they will all be together because the density of this patch is not 1.686, but half of that. Okay, so it hasn't collapsed today, but it will in the future. And that means that the that means it has shrunk, but not all the way. And that means that the pieces inside it are like the mass function today. So those are the halos today that still exist that have not yet merged. Yeah, so let's go. Yeah, so before we said this is redshift zero and these were the pieces in the initial conditions. Now we're going to say this is sometime in the future and these, this is redshift zero. And we can do the same statistics problem to say, uh, what, you know, what is the distribution of pieces in cells of, a, of some size today, of cells of size 50 megaparsecs today. If I know that that 50, if I know that the 50 megaparsec region has, is twice the background density, then what is the mix of halos in it? So we can come forward. Okay, so if I have a 50 megaparsec patch and I have one part, so there's one 50 megaparsec patch which is over dense and another elsewhere in the universe, another 50 megaparsec patch which is under dense, then what is the mix of halos in the over dense patch and in the under dense patch? So now, the, the simplest guess would be the overdense patch has higher mass. Higher mass means I can make more halos. So one possibility is the distribution of halo masses is the same, but I just have more of everything in the, bigger, in the more massive patch. And I have fewer of everything in the less massive patch, in the less dense patch. That's one possibility. But you can see from that picture that that won't be right, right? You can see from this picture that if your, if your walk has already arrived here, then it only has a little bit more to cross delta C. And so that means that the halos in dense regions are all massive. The halos in under dense regions, well, this guy has to get all the way back up to here. And so it will take many more steps before it reaches. So it won't do this, it will take a while and they will all be low mass. And so the mass function in dense regions and under dense regions will be different. Okay? So the mass function, given the large scale density, will not equal the, the, you know, the average over everything and just you have more of everything or less of everything, but there will actually be some dependence on the density. So there will be some function of the density here. What function? Well, we know it will be some, we should have more massive halos in dense regions. And so if I were to call that a bias, then I expect the bias to be a number that is growing with mass. No, because if the, if the region is dense, I want to have lots of massive halos. Okay? So, so we know how to write this problem exactly, right? We know how to write, before I said, the high redshift piece of the low redshift guy, but it can be the large scale environment and the mass, the, the virilized halo in the large scale environment. Okay. So I can now ask, this was an M0, this M0, corresponds to some volume. Suppose that my volume is big, I was saying 50 megaparsecs, then I know that the associated density is small and so it's close to the linear density. So this number is small and so that means that I can, that means this constraint is just a, a small perturbation to this, so I can expand in a Taylor series of this value. So I can expand this function in a Taylor series, and that expansion, the leading order term will be the density. Then there will be density squared, density cubed, and so on. 
the, the 50 megaparsec density squared, density cubed, and so on. Um, and so this coefficient we call the bias factor, the linear bias factor. There will be a quadratic bias factor and a cubic bias factor and so on. And you'll be hearing a lot about these bias factors next week. Okay? But next week, when you hear about them, there will be free parameters about which there is zero knowledge. And here you have a handle for actually calculating them. Okay? Now, it's a model that has come from idealizations of spherical collapse and stuff like that. Okay? So it's not going to work at 1% precision. But it does work at 10% precision. Um, for, for, for so it's, it's very good for understanding the origin of bias, and it's good for quantifying it to about 10% precision. Yeah. Um, all right. Um, the other nice thing about this picture, then I stop, uh, is you can think of, so I said there's this close connection between environment and evolution, but you can do something even nicer, which is because this random walk doesn't have far to go, you can think of this, because remember, in the, in the evolution picture, how much the barrier has changed is a change in redshift. It's, it's something to do with a growth factor. So this is a growth factor, and this is a different growth factor. Okay? So you can think of an under-dense region as having a different effective cosmology in which the growth factor grows differently than the dense region. And you know you should be able to do that, right? I should be able to use Birkhoff's theorem, and a dense region should be like a dense universe, and an under-dense region should be like an under-dense universe. Okay? And this does that exactly. Okay, so you never had to think about it, but if you work out what is this difference, and you convert this difference in delta C values into a growth factor, and you say, what is the effective cosmology associated with this growth factor? It is the one that you would have calculated. You would have said, yeah, um, because it's a higher density, omega matter is higher. Because it's a higher density, that patch is shrinking. Because the patch is shrinking, it has a different Hubble constant. And so the density is different, Hubble constant is different, so omega matter is different. Omega lambda, energy density in lambda is constant in space. So it's the same whether I'm in a dense region or in an under-dense region. But H is different. The Hubble constant is different in the high density compared to the low density universe. And so omega lambda is different. And so omega lambda plus omega matter in a dense region is a curved universe, closed. Omega matter plus omega lambda in an under-dense region is an open, is a, is a you know, open geometry, yeah? And so they have their own growth factors, and this gets that exactly right. So it's built in to the description. Now it's a powerful approach, yeah? Um, so, 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 so I'm out of time, so I should stop there. I, I haven't shown you plots of how well this kind of thing works. There are some in the slides that are online, yeah? Um, I haven't talked at all about recent improvements, the ways this doesn't work. If you're interested, come talk to me. The other experts in the room are Marcello Musso and Asim Paranjpe. Uh, they've done a lot of work on this. Yeah? And uh, Farnik uh, Nikakhtar has done some stuff on the random walk problem as well. Okay? Um, so thank you. Enjoy tea. <laughs>